Welcome everyone, I'm Harold Holzer and I have the honor of serving as the director of Roosevelt House. I'm glad you're all out on this first cold day of our lecture series um, to join us for a wonderful book celebration, not quite a launch, but a relaunch of a book by one of our favorite faculty members, one of our most inspiring teachers. Um, we're Happy to see Basil Smeichel, the head of our public policy program, and um, Hunter's Dean of Arts and Sciences, Andy Polsky, who is with us today. And welcome to students and uh, those who are passionate about this, about this subject as our special guest is. So we're proud to mark and celebrate uh, Calvin John Smiley's latest book, his first solo book project, Purgatory Citizenship, Reentry, Race, and Abolition, a book that builds on and expands on and deepens the work in his previous volume, which was a collection he co-edited with Keisha Middlemass, Prisoner Reentry in the 21st Century, Critical Perspectives on Returning Home. We had the privilege of hosting a program about that book, believe it or not, two and a half years ago um, at a time when all the programming was virtual. And um, we have some Zoom guests tonight, but it is um, always, a, it's, I just renew my enthusiasm at each program about the fact that we're able to gather again. There was a time when we thought we would never be able to meet in person and we're all here. So as, as some of you who've been to programs know, I always try to find a Roosevelt connection to celebrate the fact that we're in FDR's house uh, tonight. It's a little hard on this subject. It was not, let's face it, <coughs> a Roosevelt priority. But there is a fascinating um, coincidence in, in, um, in, Roosevelt's, in Roosevelt's life story. Um, the day after Election Day, 1932, believe it or not, the Republican candidate did not concede to FDR. Can you imagine? No concession. Even though he had only won nine out of 48 states, he still didn't concede. So Roosevelt, upstairs on the second floor, where I think some of you probably take classes in that same room, F, right? FDR, in the Gilder Room as we call it now, FDR gave what became his first fireside chat. He spoke to the public just a minute and a half from the fireplace upstairs. Doesn't count as a fireside chat, but we count it, so it wasn't in the White House. And he just pledged to work and he reassured people about his commitment to the recovery of this then very troubled and frightened country. What's less known is that after the radio address, they moved a camera in and he um, re-delivered the speech somewhat better than his first time for Fox Movie Tone News. Now, some of our younger guests may not know what that is, but it was <clears throat> a series of newsreel updates on the news that ran between movies at double features at theaters. And even in the Depression, 80 million Americans went to the movies once a week. And no one had television yet. There was no television. So this is where they saw visual news. And here was FDR on November something, 1932. And in most of the country, in the theaters, I don't want to get too complicated, but in Warner Brothers theaters, there was a new film called I Am a Prisoner from a Chain Gang, starring Paul Muni, which for many Americans was the first time they had ever heard about forced labor and other aspects of imprisonment. What a, that's my coincidence of the day. There is a relation. I knew it took me 10 minutes to get there, but I, I got there. Um, so with that kind of tortured uh, connection in mind, we're happy that Calvin is back at the house uh, where he teaches, where he's appeared to talk about this new project. Um, your bios are in your programs, but just quickly, Dr. Smiley is an assistant professor of sociology at Hunter. Uh, so, oh, yay. 
that was taken right off the last introduction. Associate Professor of Sociology at Hunter College, sorry, Kelvin, and long been an active and leading voice at Hunter and Roosevelt House on issues of criminal justice, police accountability, racial injustice, and of course, reentry. Um, the topic at the center of tonight's conversation. In his new volume, he refuses to choose between an analytical and scholarly lens and the lens of the personal and human. Um, instead, he weaves the two together to advance both, both a discussion of reentry policy and our grasp of the realities faced by the individuals who pursue that path and are most affected with restrictions on reentry. To speak with Calvin, we're delighted to welcome Sarah Hoyland. She is an associate, pro associate professor okay, of sociology at Hostos Community College and has extensive experience teaching at correctional facilities as part of the Bard Prison Initiative and currently for the John Jay Prison to College Pipeline, giving her up close experience of the world that Calvin describes in his, in his work. Um, she's been involved in a number of criminal justice related ex um, organizations and consortiums. Um, and she and Calvin are serving together on a committee to start a section on prison education within the American Sociological Association. So you can begin charting the path today. With that, please welcome Calvin John Smiley in conversation with Sarah Hoyland. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so before we begin, I just wonder if we might take a moment, um, you know, to really honor the system impacted folks that might be among us, uh, that might be zooming in, uh, and also for those who are still incarcerated, um, and just, you know, honor their, their experience. Um, you know, I hope tonight will be a meaningful inquiry into this fabulous book. Um, and one that you know leaves us with more questions than answers at the end of the evening. And um, I also just want to give a huge shout out to any CUNY students that might be here. Um, you know, and thank you to, to the event staff for, for hosting us. So let's delve right in. Um, you know, my first question when I met Calvin to talk about this book was, what took so long, right? You know, and I have the same experience. It took me 10 years, you know, after I finished sort of my research to actually get the book out. And so, you know, the research for this book took place from 2010 to 2013, and the book came out in 2023. And, you know, Dr. Smiley was not sitting on his laurels during that time. You know, as you heard, he edited a different book. He has another book coming out next year, um, you know, and certainly was doing lots of things to to get tenured and promoted at Hunter. And so, you know, my question is, you know, why go back to this research and, and these men and women that you met, you know, as a graduate student in Newark? Sure, so first, thank you all for being here. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and then some new faces, so I appreciate everyone coming. And thank you, Sarah, for, for doing this tonight. Um, to that question, I think sometimes, especially when you do qualitative research, it takes time to really think through um, the participants' words and your experiences with them. And so that took some time. And, and, and so let me answer it in a couple different ways. One, um, I got a job, and then I left that job to take this job. <laughs> um, I had gotten very ill. Uh, I had two bouts of appendicitis. We can save that for another conversation. Um, I had other familial uh, issues that were happening, and you know, as we all know, life happens. Then there was this global pandemic thing that went down um, that took some time. So you know, life got in the way. Um, and then for anyone uh, who's written a dissertation or is going to write a dissertation, writing a dissertation is different than writing a book, right? So all when 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 University of California Press gave me the book contract, they were like, "We love the idea." Get rid of all the academic jargon. Mm -hmm. And you and you're like, what? <laughs> what? And they're like, we love those stories that you've told, just expand upon them. So I really had to go back, listen to a lot of the interviews, the focus groups that I had recorded, sit with those thoughts, kind of think about what were the narratives, what were the stories that I thought were 
the most important to talk about uh, that uh, made the strongest argument. And yeah, that just took, that took uh, a long, short 10 years, if that makes sense. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, as we'll get into, you know, the book is, uh, is deeply personal, right? And the, you know, as a fellow ethnographer, I think when you, you know, spend years with people, they stay with you, right? So you might leave the official site, um, but the site doesn't leave you, right? You know, just like um, teaching in the prison, right? I leave the prison, but, you know, part of that is is still with me. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the timeliness of this book can't be overstated. Um, you know, in 2023 now, people are talking about decarceration, like, you know, it's an everyday term. Prisons are closing. Um, you know, the prison population, as you, you know, sort of eloquently lay out at the end of the book, you know, is half of what it was, you know, just prior to the peak in 2008. And so, you know, can you lay out just sort of like the importance of critical reentry studies now? And, um, and also, you know, potentially some of the pitfalls of, you know, of the business of reentry and kind of looking at reentry in this neoliberal form as a, as a money-making enterprise. Yeah, so I think one of the more nefarious aspects of decarceration is that uh, systems and corporations have figured out how to still monetize folks who have been justice impacted. So we've seen um, you know, a growth and proliferation in ankle monitors and other kind of GPS software that kind of does what we call e-carceration. So we don't necessarily need the traditional brick and mortar to hold people. Um, in a kind of perpetual way that we at one point did. Um, I think that it's obviously really important to continue to shrink our, our jail and prison population. Um, but what we've seen, especially like in New Jersey where the, where the, where the uh, prison population got cut in half was that the percentages stayed the same. So still over 60% of all incarcerated people in the state of New Jersey are black or identify as black. Um, the highest percentage of those who are committed to state prison come from Essex County where Newark is. So yes, the numbers have shrunk, but the populations have remained the same. So what we're still wrestling with is how do we combat violence that's happening in these communities? So yes, it's great that we go from 10 to five, but if that same five are the same people in those communities, then the other five who haven't been incarcerated are still getting kind of what we'd call the indirect exposure to incarceration, the traumas that come with incarceration, the um, uh, loss of family members uh, who, to incarceration. So we have to continue to still think uh, deeply about what that means if we're gonna incarcerate people and how do we, again, as I try to argue, continually combat uh, uh, perpetual incarceration. So, you know, we're in a place of policy, right? And, you know, there's a lot of policy implications in your book, and we're gonna get into a lot of those, hopefully, if we have time a little bit more specifically, but, you know, I think when you publish a book like this, you know who's gonna read it, right? Like, you have your people, you know, we met in a group with that kind of mindset. Um, but, like, you know, is there an audience that you hope might read this book? Or like, you know, are there people that you don't think would ever read this book that could or should read this book and why? Yes, so, uh, you know, the that's always the kind of age old question when you're, write, um, when you're trying to get a book uh, manuscript, a publisher asks, who's the audience? And then you say, well, everyone's the audience because obviously uh, you want them to give you a book contract. But in, in more, uh, in a more serious note, I think that this is a book that obviously folks who are invested in decarceration or abolition should read. Um, I think that policymakers should be uh, interested in this work because at least the way I think about abolition is that I don't think it's a big scary word of uh, being synonymous with anarchy, right? Abolition doesn't mean that, you know, it's just open the gates and let <laughs> fire and brimstone. But I tried to, at least in that last chapter, break down how folks who are coming out of prison, who are justice impacted, who experience that uh, um, uh, setting, are thinking through, well, how do we have alternatives to prison? And what should we be then doing in those, in those kind of steps towards moving away from these kind of punitive and really um, uh, uh, cruel forms of uh, 
holding people, right? We, we know that prisons don't necessarily deter crime. We, don't, we know that they don't um, necessarily give people <coughs> rehabilitative services or other kind of programmatic uh, things that they might need. So we can think about abolition as kind of a step process and not necessarily the end, but the beginning of where do we go next. So I would hope that the book is read by a wide audience, but I hope it's really taken serious by those who have their fingers on the buttons and the levers of how to make change. And I think that there are things that the book talks about as well as uh, uh, that, that, are, that are very um, short-term things. So one thing I'll say is when we think about restoring people's rights, so oftentimes uh, if you are incarcerated and have a felony, you lose uh, a number of rights depending on where you live, what state, uh, and that can be anything from certain legal rights, such as voting, to where you can live in terms of housing, other social service benefits. Uh, I mean, that's something I think that policymakers can, can, can change in the very immediate, right? Why are we putting people through um, certain forms of perpetual punishment if, after, if they've already done their quote-unquote time for, for their you know, crime? Um, because then what happens is if someone messes up, then they go back to prison. So what happens is people go to prison, they come out, they're now on a much shorter leash, and then they're just told, do good. And we all mess up in life. And some of those things that people mess up on that send them back to prison is having a cigarette in a federal halfway house, something that you and I would be able to do, or wear certain colors, or have markers on their body, uh, on their person, wearing, um, you know, rosary beads in some instances could be seen as gang paraphernalia, and that can send you back to, to jail or prison. So there's all these kind of things that we can do right in the immediate that can then lead us towards uh, thinking about care over cruelty. Yeah, I think that was one of the most poignant things about the book was hearing the reentry stories, right, like in detail over time. So, you know, you talk a lot about housing and the need for housing, right? And, you know, I've read studies saying, you know, 15 to 20 percent of homeless or underhoused folks are incarcerated folks, right? Formerly incarcerated folks that just can't find a place to live. And so, you know, I wonder if, if you might speak a little bit about some of those just basic needs, right? Um, beyond the kind of like, you know, the small symbolic aspects, like what are those, what are the big roadblocks, um, you know, and, and get into a little bit of this concept of doing reentry. Like what does it mean to do reentry? And you know, how might that mean finding housing, um, you know, if your family lives in public housing and you're not allowed to go back and live there because of, you know, in New York City, like NYCHA's rules or so on and so forth. Or, you know, what does that mean in terms of finding a job? Or what does that mean in terms of, um, you know, becoming a, a father? Or like in one case you described, you know, a woman who had been incarcerated for a long time and wanted to adopt children and was not able to. So. You know, can you describe a little bit the process of doing reentry and then some of these, you know, big, huge boulders in front of like actually being able to do reentry? Yeah. So, so the initial question that I went into this project with was, how do folks navigate and negotiate <coughs> the reentry process with diminished legal rights and amplified social stigmas? So, you know, we know that people are disenfranchised. We know that being quote unquote labeled an ex-con can have negative. Uh, stigmas when you're trying to apply for a job, et cetera. But what I found while, while doing the, the, the research and working with these folks at this community-based reentry organization was that many of them had a do, uh, what I call do reentry, which became this kind of actionable type of process where um, oftentimes it meant sitting in programs, um, doing other kind of service uh, uh, that not necessarily was something that benefited them. So for instance, there were guys who attended AA and NA, not necessarily because they had substance abuse problems, but because it lowered their time in state prison. So they were like, I'll, I'll go sit in a couple meetings. Meanwhile, you had other folks who might have really needed it, but couldn't get into it, or taking other types of uh, programmatic classes. So uh, I think I talk about it in the book, there was one guy who, you know, sat, sat back, or he, you know, like kind of gave out this big huff and he said to me, he said, Smiley, I'm all grouped out. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that was like, 
all day, every day, he's sitting in different groups, parenting groups, anger management groups, um, uh, NA groups, AA groups. And, and he was like, all of them tell us the same thing. Change your people, places, and things, you know, one day at a time, you know, let go, let God. And he's like, at some point, I got to stop doing groups and start looking for a job. I got to start looking for housing. But if I'm supposed to be at a group at 11 a.m. and I'm not there, then I go back to jail because my PO said, you got to be here. So, or if I go apply for a job and the halfway house tells me I have 20 minutes to get from the halfway house to the community-based reentry center and that Dunkin' Donuts says, has a hiring sign and I go out and I go try to fill out the, the application and I start talking to the manager and I don't get to the reentry center until 35 minutes, they're gonna send the marshals out for me because uh, I'm now considered a fugitive because I've, I've run away. So there were all of these things that folks had to do and oftentimes these rituals and these ceremonies came with various um, uh, 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 diplomas or certificates at the end. And you know, sometimes they, they were on very nice construction paper with like the gold leaf kind of border and you know, someone's ink named on it and they can show this to a parole officer or uh, a judge in some cases. But in other cases, you know, it was whatever was printed out on blue loose leaf paper with, you know, a little teddy bear on it because that was all that whoever was printing out their certificate had. So there was all these times where folks were like, I'm just doing this not necessarily because I think it's actually gonna help me, um, but because this is how I need to be seen as credible. And so to your question about employment and housing, we know that statistically, the two main things that folks need when they're coming out of jail and prison is uh, a job and like a, a well-paying job and housing and not just sleeping on someone's couch, but like a legitimate home or an apartment, something like that. But what I learned in my research was that in, in order to get both of those things, you need identification, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the most simple answer. And a lot of folks didn't have that. And, you know, you gotta imagine if you're away 20 plus years, your birth certificate, your social security card might be gone. In some instances, folks didn't have, didn't know their social security number. Um, and then, you know, if you had a kind of more common name, you know, it took a while for the system to go through all of that. So a lot of folks were, were very frustrated with this system because they really felt stuck. And um, so yeah, I think the first thing was not losing, or excuse me, having identification to even start that process for all of these other things that they might need. Also including uh, healthcare, right? Folks talked about actually getting um, uh, not great healthcare, but at least some healthcare while they were incarcerated. So, you know, I remember one gentleman was diabetic and uh, you know, he was able to get his insulin every day when he was in jail, but when he'd come out, he didn't have that same uh, 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 opportunity to get it and actually had gone into diabetic shock uh, a couple times and, you know, was in the hospital, out of the hospital, and then, you know, going to the hospital, you now accruing debt because they don't have health insurance. So it was this kind of, again, this kind of snowballing of, you know, racking up debt, not being able to uh, get out of this kind of perpetual hole. Yeah, wow. So that, I mean, it brings me to, you know, another illogical rule that says, right, felons can't fraternize with each other, right? That yeah. they shouldn't gather, that they shouldn't have any contact with people that they were incarcerated with. And so, you know, you point out in the book that this is like, you know, exactly what reentry centers are for, right? Is for all these people who were incarcerated, many of whom knew each other while they were in prison, now to come together and, you know, get access to services, which could put them in violation of their parole, right? Um, you know, and similarly, you know, you talk about there's a scene where, you know, one of the guys is talking about a counselor they had in prison and, you know, the counselor lost their job because they thought that she cared too much, right? And so, you know, there's this real effort to keep people who've been incarcerated isolated and alone, not just in prison, but once they, you know, return back home. And so, um, you also talked just now a little bit about sort of the bodily harms of prison. And you know, one of my favorite chapters in the book was the chapter on the body. And you know, there are all these physical side effects which you, know, you and the interviews you know, really bring to light, but then there's you know, the mental and emotional things. And I'm wondering if maybe you can just share you know, a story or two that came up that you think kind of particularly highlight the kinds of physical and mental baggage that people take home with them. Yeah, so you know, 
when we think about reentry, we often think of it as kind of the end of this cycle of being incarcerated. And my argument is that it's an extension of the criminal legal system that doesn't necessarily end just because you've gotten out. And I think um, this chapter on the body is one of the ones that really highlights that. So, you know, there are physical scars, like quite literally, if you've been slashed across the face by a razor or some kind of sharp object, and now you have a huge uh, keloid across your face, that doesn't necessarily leave you because you've now um, left prison. Um, there are also the kind of unseen kind of physical ailments, right? So the arthritis, you know, the premature arthritis, the needing of glasses, the loss of hearing that folks went through. Um, you know, there, there was uh, one, one gentleman who um, talked about being beat up at every stage of being in the criminal justice system. So starting at the age of around 16, being beat up by a local cop in Newark. And, you know, he and his, I think he, maybe he was even younger, maybe he was like 13, 14. And, you know, he said he and his friends were stealing bikes, being stupid. And a cop ca caught them. And this grown man just decided to, you know, beat them up. And he said, every time I see you, I'm going to beat you up. And he said that that cop made do on that promise, you know, for the next several years. You know, whenever he would see him, he would stop him, throw him against the wall, give him a couple of licks, and then not even arrest him. Then he talked about, when he was incarcerated and being, um, you know, assaulted, you know, by uh, bailiffs going in and out from the courthouse. Um, and then he talks about being in prison and, and uh, being beat up by corrections officers and also having to, you know, survive this, you know, really violent space of what prison uh, creates. And, you know, he showed me all of this, these, these different marks on his body, right? You know, the scar on his head from the first time he got slammed against the wall or on the ground by the cop. The, um, you know, marks on his wrists from having cuffs on that were too tight. Um, but like he said, those are all things that, you know, that pain has gone away. It's the, it's the things that are unseen, you know, the, the uh, things that he witnessed in jail, the things that he can't just let go of, right? And like he said, he said, I'm getting better, but, you know, you can't expect someone essentially just getting out today to all of a sudden just be okay around people, right? You know, a lot of the guys, I, when I would do interviews with the guys, uh, we would sit in a room at the reentry center, by ourselves would be a closed door, and none of them could ever sit with their backs to the door. They didn't like that, because that was an, that was an unfamiliar and a very unsafe thing, because they were always like, I got to see who's coming in. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, no one's coming in. No, no, I got to see who's coming in. And so that's something that, you know, we have to kind of recognize, that prisons and jails create these traumas, right? There's been studies and research that shows that Putting someone in, in solitary confinement for more than 13 days literally changes the physiology of the brain, right? And so a lot of these guys had sat in solitary, had been put into situations where um, they were just unsafe. Um, last thing I'll say on that, and this was a guy who, who had a roommate, and he talked about the only time he talked to his, his, his cellmate, right? This was something in one of the chapters I talk about. It was called the, the bathroom politics, right? Again, if you're sharing a very small space with another individual, you have to be very, you have to recognize that what you put in your body is going to come out, and that might, you know, not jive with the other person. And this one gentleman talked about how, and he was older, and he talked about how they gave him a younger, uh, uh, I'll say, roommate. And the guy, on the first day that the guy was there, the guy peed on the seat, and he didn't clean it. And he told the young man, he said, you got to clean that up. And he said, they lived together for the next nine months and didn't speak. I couldn't imagine living in a very small space with somebody and not speaking for nine months. Think about the anxiety, the paranoia, the stress that that causes. That doesn't just go away because it's like, I'm free now, right? And so there's all these kind of traumas that people um, uh, absorb that, again, you know, are going to be kind of lifelong measurements of, of trying to get over those hurdles. Yeah, I mean, I... You know, I think sleep is something I think about a lot when I think about my students. Uh, you know, a lot of our medium security facilities are dormitory style housing. Uh, and one of my students actually did a, a research project on sleep and sort of what, you know, continued lack of sleep does, uh, you know, psychologically, emotionally, you know, spiritually. Um, you know, one of your, uh, I think it was Sharif, talked about the shoe as being um, death to the soul. Right. Um, 
but you know, there's there's some really serious health implications, right? And you talked about kind of a PTSD response to you know not being able to to sit without seeing exits and things like that. Um, you know, and I think there's also this real sense of um, you know difficulty dealing with people, right? So you know, there was a an excerpt where one of the interview uh, respondents had said something about that his roommate was smearing feces on the wall of their shared cell. And so he violated, uh, I think he ended up punching the, the correctional officer who was laughing about what was occurring, right? So he had reported it, hey, something needs to be done, and the CO thought it was funny, and so he punched the CO and ended up in solitary for six months. And it was to get out of that horrific situation, right? So his only, um, response was violence, right? And then to put himself in a situation where he would be in this, you know, horrible environment just to get out of that situation. And, you know, I've heard story after story like that, right? Where, you know, people don't want to leave a cell and go into a dormitory where there's 16 men sleeping in a room, right? Because it's difficult to sleep, right? And so, you know, this kind of like pack them in and save money and, you know, like, the sad thing is that those are the folks that then are getting ready to be released, right? The ones who come from dormitory style housing. So, you know, I think like that, that bodily and mental and spiritual harm that, you know, you spend an entire chapter talking about is something I haven't seen, you know, written about as much. And I really commend you for doing that. Um, I wonder if maybe you can talk a little bit about your choice of purgatory um, and all of its, you know, religious connotations and and denotations and um, you know sort of what that limbo looks like you know and if you like um, you know Sharif actually has a great quote about it um, so maybe we'll read to you guys a little bit from the book but you know why purgatory why another word to describe you know this particular state and then you know how how did you actually see this play out this state of limbo yeah so the, the, the press actually chose the title. That was something that was written in the book, um, and, they, and they liked it more than the title I gave them. So I was like, oh, that works. Oh, wait, what was the title you gave oh, them? Oh, uh, I think it was just Confined Freedom. I think I, I think I still use that in here. But um, I talk about this idea of purgatory citizenship, and then the press was like, oh, that, that's a lot better. Um, you know. <laughs> you know okay. that's, yeah. Um, but, you know, I... Disclaimer: I grew up. I grew up Catholic. Uh, you know, uh, there's a longer story behind that. I converted. My mom converted me when I was in first grade because it was cheaper tuition at the Catholic school I went to. So there's all of that. But that's for another conversation. But so I'd known about this concept of purgatory for a, a very long time, right? And you know, it, it kind of it kind of just stuck out in my in my head a bit about when I started thinking about this through this act of doing reentry, this atonement for what one had done before, and you have to kind of go through these rites and rituals and ceremonies to at least at some level be seen as whole again, right? And whether you ever get there or not does, does not have a, doesn't have a time stamp. So I, I guess somewhere deep in my brain from studying for religion tests in fourth grade and fifth grade, mm. This term kind of came back to me, and I and I looked it up, and then I looked up, did anybody else use this term anywhere else? And I was like, oh, no one's ever used this. Mm. So I thought, this is a good idea. And then, you know, also what the guys were telling me, so as you said, Sharif talks about this idea, and, and other guys have talked about this in different, in different language and style, but this idea of being in limbo, right? Mm. This idea of coming home, and often most of them were on some form of um, parole, probation, in some instances, some were even still under direct uh, Department of Correction supervision, but we're living at a halfway house now. Um, and so they were like, we can kind of see freedom, but you know, we're not really, we're not really afforded it fully. And so I was thinking about um, the ways in which we deport people in the United States when they've broken a rule if they're not American citizens, right? And so uh, we have this massive deportation uh, arm within our our system, and but I was like, but these folks are not getting deported, right? They they can't be in in this way, right? They were born here, they're American, but we can still isolate them out of society. We can still keep them marginal. We can still uh, make sure that whatever they do 
has limits to it. And that's where I kind of landed on the idea of purgatory is part of this idea of thinking through citizenship. And, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, like in every facet of society, language is constantly changing and evolving and we don't use terms like ex-con or, or felon because of the, the negative con connotations and stigmas that it comes with. Um, and so we use terms like justice impacted, returning residents, and even there's a term re returning citizens. And I'm not against the term returning citizens, I just don't think it actually talks about the people that I'm, that I'm talking about in this book because they're not returning citizens, they're returning residents because they're not getting all of the benefits that you and I and other folks have in terms of you know, housing, voting, health care, you know, all of these things. So I think it's a misleading term. It's actually cruel to call people returning citizens. And again, if someone who's justice impacted says I'm a returning citizen, I'm not gonna argue with them, but I'm just saying, I would love to see us get to a point where that, that term actually means something in a kind of whole way. Yeah, like someone with rights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I've often brought up that critique with the word reentry, right? Because, you know, when I talk to my students about it, like they don't identify with the word reentry at all, right? It's like, you know, what did I like go to outer space and now I'm reentering the earth's surface, right? Like, you know, they didn't choose to leave and so reentry is is also not their choice, right? Like um but I think, you know, in in the context that you're using it, critical reentry right, makes a lot of sense as a study, right, but sort of to describe the process as reentry, you know, uh, carceral citizenship, you know, um, uh, purgatory, you know, all these make a lot more sense to me. Um, so let's get to abolition, right? Okay. I think we only have about five minutes and I, I want to spend as much time as we can on, on solution. Um, and probably that word is what got me up here. We were in a meeting together and I said, well, <laughs> is this group gonna focus on abolition? And it was like, <gasps> shh, quiet. <laughs> and then Calvin said something. I was like, okay, I'm not alone. And then, you know, it ended up happening that the group will focus on that, right? But, um, you know, all that is just to say, uh, a lot of people who work in this field, who work with these populations, you know, who might be liberal, progressive, you know, you say the word abolition and, well, do you mean for them? Like, what about the, and then fill in the blank of the offense, what about the, you know, and, and the answer is yes, right? We mean for all of them. And so, um, you know, if you could lay out some of the points that you raise in that chapter, right? What are some of the things to think about? You know, what do you imagine, right, in this abolitionist, um, solution, um, you know, what are some of the, the main tenets? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'm an abolitionist. Uh, I have no bones about that. Um, and so, you know, in working with, with these folks um, who had been, you know, justice impacted, you know, I was thinking like, how do I bring up alternatives to incarceration? Because I would be lying to say that, you know, everyone who I spoke to was an abolitionist. Um, there were folks who were very adamant about certain crimes, even being of that convict class, as we'll say, uh, who were like, yeah, there's certain crimes that, man, you know what I mean? But there, was a, there were two things that happened during my time in the field there that were kind of two significant events. The first was the uh, re-election of o uh, Obama, right? A lot of the guys were really like keen in on that, right? Because they couldn't vote. But the other was uh, the death and the murder of Trayvon Martin. And you know, for several weeks into almost several months, that became the, the topic of conversation in these groups that I was running, guys wanting to talk about that because as we all remember, right, you know, Trayvon's, Trayvon Martin's death is what catapulted Black Lives Matter. That was one of the kind of first kind of like hashtag movements. And you had folks who were being really reflective on what what that meant, right? And there were, there were, there were guys who were optimistic that you know they were going to get George Zimmerman. There were guys who were pessimistic who were like, "Nah, this is going to be the same old, same old." But then there were guys who were like, "Well, I killed somebody, right?" And they had to kind of really think about their own experiences. And I remember one guy, I think it was uh, Melvin, said, "Well, what if we didn't put George Zimmerman in prison?" And you know, there was this kind of again this gasp in the room, like, "What do you mean, don't put him in prison?" 
And he said, well, we all been through that. We know that didn't do anything for us, right? What did it do for us? It took away our family. It took away our loved ones, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that, like, started the conversation. So, you know, I think, like, the next week or something like that, I brought all this stuff on abolition and, you know, uh, some stuff from Angela Davis and all this kind of stuff. And I kind of gave this, uh, I gave more of a presentation than it was a conversation. And this was a dynamic talking group. They love to talk. And I talked for maybe, like, 30 minutes, and then it was, like, crickets. It was like science. I was like, oh, man, I lost them. I, I was like, oh, this, is, this is over. And this one older gentleman, he put his hand up. He goes, you mean all prisons? And I was like, yeah, all prisons. He goes, well, abolition's the solution, right? And that, and that at least gave us the, 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 the lens into start talking about abolition. And so a lot of that chapter, at least the way I think it's written, is that it doesn't write from abolition from some theoretical utopian, right? But it writes it from the perspective of how these guys started thinking through abolition through our ongoing conversations. So for instance, um, one of the things that, they, that the guys kind of came to was this idea of how can we parse out separation versus segregation? And so they were like, prison segregates us. It, segre it segregates us from ourselves. It segregates us from our family. It segregates us from our jobs. It, you know, it, does, it does this whole kind of stripping of humanity away from us. Where they said separation is something that we all know, right? When we get upset, we need a cool out period. So what could an alternative to prison look like that gives folks who need a cool out period some time away, but doesn't, necessar doesn't necessarily strip them of their humanity, their dignity, their self-respect. So that was something that we started thinking through. We also started thinking through the idea of restoring all rights, right? Which I said earlier, this idea that, you know, it could be very much a stroke of a pen that people can uh, get their voting rights back. And we saw that. So in the midst of, going back to what you said earlier, in the midst of writing this, at the end of December of 2019, the uh, governor of New Jersey, Phil Murphy, gave voting rights back to people on parole and probation. Prior to that, if you were on parole or probation or incarcerated in the state of New Jersey, you couldn't vote. So in the midst of me writing this and thinking, oh, no, he, he ruined my book. No, I'm just kidding. But like <laughs> this idea of like, no, there's this, there's this, you know, this stuff is live, right? This, I'm not writing a historical book. I'm writing a book that can very much change uh, by, by the signing of, of legislation. Mm. Then there's also the idea of thinking through both short-term and long-term abolition. And so short-term abolition are the things that we can probably, again, do in the immediate, right? We don't need to put people on solitary confinement. We don't need to put people on death row and, and, and put needles in people's arms and then claim that's a humane way of killing someone. I always think, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, who's saying it's humane? The person dying? I mean, you know, it's a ridiculous statement to say that killing someone by a needle is, is humane. It's, it's, it's preposterous. So there's all these kind of short-term things that we can do that are still part of an abolitionist framework while we are constantly chipping away at a carceral system that, you know, uh, takes money away from communities and puts them into these, uh, into these uh, systems. And so the long-term vision, and again, I have no... Uh, I'm not a, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a realistic person. I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. But again, we have to do the work now. And I'll give one quick example of how that works. So I'm sure many of us have heard of Khalif Browder, right, the 16-year-old who went to Rikers Island for three and a half years, was not convicted, his case was finally thrown out, right? His story got huge, and then it got bigger after uh, uh, he took his own life. It wasn't until 2017, so that was 2010 to 2013, he took his life in 2015. It wasn't until the end of 2017 and then into 2018 that New York State passed the Raise the Age Act that now takes all juveniles out of Rikers Island and puts them into juvenile facilities. And then it took till 2021 for all of DOC, Department of Corrections, to be out of those juvenile facilities, and now it's completely run by the Administration of Children's Services, right? That... That is the movement, that is the needle that we're pushing. Because my hope is that before I die, juvenile facilities like Horizons, like Crossroads, they don't exist. But that, there's a process to it. And there's also a process because we also have to take into consideration just, just closing all prisons in the immediate can actually do more harm than good. Especially if we haven't uh, 
rectified communities, right? We can't just put people back into poverty, back into violence. So we have to really invest in anti-poverty uh, anti legislation. We have to create housing, healthcare, education, you know, all of the things that we need to do. And we know we can do them, right? My thing is always, it's not that we can't do them, do we have the will to do them? Oh, that's a great segue. So now we have some time for audience questions. Maybe they need it for the for the Zoom folks. Yeah, I want to pick up on your last point because I was thinking about this and it feeds into it. What about the next level of their responsibility to society? What if we didn't have to provide and we could have the separation and they take on the responsibility for their lives, their future? They probably or may or may not have goals, but we build into it we're going to give you the opportunity to develop for all of yourselves, but it's up to you. We're not giving you stuff right now, except support. Is that part of your thinking that we don't have to really uplift them? We have to give them the uplifting possibility. Then they have to take on the responsibility in terms of leaving their lives like we've all had to do in our lives. So when you say, um we don't have to take on responsibility. Who's the we? I just want to be clear. Like well, me the ones you? that you're talking about in terms of giving them housing, giving them this, that, and the other. That we, back in the 30s, there was a, a setup where they gave, set up land, set up a village, set up the opportunity for them to get skills, and then put them together. And all of a sudden, they developed their own communities, their own lives, and so forth. But it was them taking on their responsibilities for their future as you take on a responsibility being an associate professor and for your family. Can we at some point say, with abolition, we're going to give you the opportunity, but now it's on you? So, so I would say that you know, there's always personal responsibility in all of these things that, that we discuss, but I think it's the state's responsibility to give a lot of these folks the opportunities because you know, when we look at the numbers, most of these people who end up in our jail and prison system are there because the state didn't afford them opportunities before they got there. So for instance, I'll just use the juveniles that I work with, because I also do a lot of work with the juveniles here in New York City. There's all different types of programs, right, that they have in the facility. They have culinary, they have restorative justice, they have exercise, they have uh, um, music, studio time, all this kind of stuff. Where is that in the community, <laughs> right? Why does a kid have to get to jail before he can get the opportunity to get studio time for free to make music, right? So I think that we have, as a, as a state, right? I mean, that, you know, I'll jump into my political science hat here for a little bit, right? We all sign this social contract, right? Because the state is supposed to be there to provide for us. And if the state isn't doing that, then the state has failed these, these, these men in this book, right? Because again, even though I talked to most of these folks as they were older, a lot of them, their first, touches with the criminal justice system was when they were young. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, if the safety net is going to jail, the state has a lot to do, you know, a lot to build back up. You know, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, that, that's my response, is that I think the state has to actually provide a lot of these things. I, you know, I don't know if it's doing it, you know, in that sense, but I, that's where I'm at with it. I, you know, giving, giving people land and letting them you know, live on their own is, is a lofty idea, but you know, you have to remember that not everyone wants to do that, right? If they're from the, the Bronx, they want to stay in the Bronx. They, you know, people don't necessarily want to leave where they're from. They just want opportunities and services and, and uh, you know, safe, clean housing and stuff like that. You know, think about NYCHA, NYCHA housing, right? You know, it's, it, that's state, that's publicly owned, right? The, you know, that, that should be upheld by the state, you know, by the city, by the government. Well, yeah. and just to say, you also mentioned in the book, you know, and, and I've heard, I don't know how many stories about the harm that the state has done to incarcerated people and their families, right? So, you know, there's a little segment in the book that talks about the harm that's done to children when they see their parents get arrested. And, you know, I've heard stories about the children being zip-tied with guns pointed at them while mom or dad's getting arrested. I mean, you know, those kinds of things are, are more than just... Um, you know, sort of a, a personal responsibility question. I mean, I think there's there's real harm that's been done that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, not just within individuals, but within families and entire communities. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I thought that was my turn. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. Um, sorry, just pulling out my question. Uh, my name is Matt Thompson. Um, I'm a first year uh, PhD student in sociology at the Grad Center. Um, my question is, uh, you pointed out that in writing this book, um, most of your accounts were drawn from black males. That's correct. Um, so social dominance theorists maintain that subordinate outgroup males face the greatest targeting for punishment and discrimination in group-based social hierarchies, uh, which the United States is. It seems that the issue we see in reentry are reflective of that sociological reality. Uh, so my question is, in forming recommendations for improving the criminal legal system, particularly the reentry process, how should we deal with this root issue? So the root issue of the social dominance theory? Right. Right, so there's a long history of that, right? And so my response to that is that we, we need to change the system completely, right? And that's why, for me, it's not reform, right? Reform is, you know, how do we improve on something? But if, if, it, was, if it was started with the psychology or the, or the social dominance of what you're talking about, how do, we, how do we change that? So I think for me, the response would be that we need to rethink our entire orientation to what we call the quote unquote system. So I don't know if that, is is detailed enough, but that's that's what you know. You know, we have to. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, um, Calvin. Congratulations! Oh, I can't you. wait thank to you. read it. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, burn everything down, start over. Um, totally with that. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, you know, uh, the idea that the state is neutral is nonsense. It doesn't exist. Never has. Um, this semester, I'm teaching a class on debt, and one of the one of the th and I'm, this is my question. One of the things that I taught earlier in the semester was a chapter from a book by Aaron Carrico, who writes about the ways in which that were black people were freed after emancipation, got were put into perpetual debt, and so the phrase he uses were they were always 12 years away from freedom, and I'm wondering, just based on what your comment last was to the gentleman in the front, was about where. You know, there is, and also from what you just said, um, that the um, growth of monitoring systems that put people into this perpetual sense of purgatory is in some ways also proximate with this idea about debt and the ways in which those systems have put black people coming out of emancipation when they were quote unquote freed in perpetually 12 years away from freedom. Right, so there's a perpetual def, you know, deferring of freedom, hence going back to the fact that the state has never been and that never will be neutral or nonviolent towards certain groups of people. It's required for the state, right? So thank you again. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't have any response. I agree. <laughs> I, I, I agree. Is there a uh, country or countries that we should look to that's offering alternatives that work? So there are countries that do other things, right? Um, a lot of the Nordic countries are usually the kind of ones where a lot of people look towards as more progressive, but they're still carceral. And one thing that I would say is um, as those countries are getting more and more quote, you know, brown people, they're, they're starting to change up a bit. They're starting to say, well, you know, What's going on? So, you know, US, U.S. incarceration has also been very much outsourced to other places. So, like, I think it was, like, England recently, right? So England has disproportionately more black people in prison than even the U.S., and they've actually started to take on more U.S. types of sentencing where, like, it's like, mm -hmm. let's, let's put people in prison for longer. My argument would be, like, let's, let's think about something that's just not prison. Like, why does prison have to be our way of dealing with with social acts of, uh, uh, you know, and, and you know, and, and again, and I'm a sociologist, crime is a social construct, right? A, a young man goes in the South Bronx and shoots another young man, we're ready to give him 25 to life. Young man, 
uh, you, you know, from Westchester, puts on a United States Army uniform, goes to the Middle East and, and whacks a lot of people down, we might give them the Medal of Honor. So, you know, the idea of who gets killed and how we treat them is based on who you're killing for and the power that comes with it. So, again, I'm not saying go kill people in the South Bronx, but I'm saying we have to also recognize the contradiction in how we value life. So, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> Hi. So my question to you is, um, having worked in the shelter system, what I've noticed is that we have a new thing, a new dynamic that's happening where formerly incarcerated individuals are now entering shelter systems in mass numbers, and they're calling this housing. This is not housing. Mm. So my question to you is, how are they addressing that issue? Because it's like over 47% of people coming from the prisons into the shelter systems and they're not being housed. They have no way of being housed because either they have a mental health diagnosis and it takes them several years to even get out of that. And, um, you know, meaning getting, getting out of the shelter system to be placed in like a system where they can have on-site staff being able to address those uh, mental health issues or even it disabilities. So my thing is, how are they addressing housing? Because it's a big problem uh, for the formerly incarcerated individuals. And then also, I wanted to address bail. Can you talk a little bit more about bail? Because bail is another reason why there is a high number of incarcerated individuals in New York City. Yeah, so uh, my, my short answer to the housing question is that we're not doing it, or we're not doing enough. I mean, there's been pilot studies, both here in New York, I think Idaho, Florida, where they've literally just said, we're gonna give someone like a small apartment and a social worker. And it's dramatically decreased the cost because otherwise we see people cycling in and out of the jail system, in and out of uh, emergency rooms, uh, 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 the shelter system, which we know is not necessarily Long, it's, no, it's not long-term housing. It's supposed to be very short-term. So, you know, my argument is we just need to give people housing, like, quite literally. But, you know, there's something very American about, like, what do you mean just give people housing? Like, you have to work hard for that, right? You know, Manhattan's average rent is, like, $4,000 now or some wild, wild amount of money. Who's affording this? And, you know, unless we're just kicking all of the low-income people out of New York City... Uh, you know, we have to figure that out. And so that means that it's going to take, dare I say, brave politicians that, you know, challenge the real estate groups and challenge landlords and challenge these systems that won't lower rent and won't do those types of things. Um, and, and, and yeah, and, and to, your, to the question on bail, so, you know, bail has become like the new boogeyman in New York City uh, because uh, there was the bail reform and the NYPD and the corrections union used that as kind of the, the, the like, well, that's, that's the everything is wrong. And it's not really the case, right, that, uh, uh, first of all, judges still get a lot of discretion. Most violent crimes are still not getting bail or they're setting a, a bail. What they were essentially trying to do was get nonviolent crimes out of the jail system because we know that putting someone in jail, even for the weekend, can have devastating impacts on one's life, both physical harm, em mental, emotional harm, but then just think about all the very pragmatic things, right? Say you get sent to jail, you don't pick up your kids, your kids are now being sent to ACS, now you have an ACS case. Say you're supposed to get your rent in that weekend, you didn't get your rent in, now you got an eviction notice. Say you missed work, you have lost your job. You know, there's all of these kind of perpetual collateral consequences for even putting people in jail for a very short term. Uh, uh, so we have to really think that bail is not the boogeyman, right? Bail is not uh, what's, what's driving crime. You know, we just came out of a pandemic where like millions of people died and hundreds of thousands of people lost housing and jobs. You know, the fact that we aren't all just living in some kind of post-apocalyptic uh, the Walking Dead, I think we're doing pretty good. You know, you know, I'm, I'm being kind of like somewhat jokey, but also kind of serious, right? That we've kind of held it together. And then when we see the cops talk about crime has gone up, yes, there's been spikes in crime. But again, context, and it's not where it was in 1990 at all. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, again. And our last question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to make it a two-parter. 
Part one. Yes. So, Calvin, something you said early on struck me, if I heard the numbers correctly. New Jersey cut its prison population in half, <clears throat> but the racial percentage stayed the same. That's not what I would have expected, actually. I would have thought that the incarceration rate for minorities would have gone up because they would be more likely to be kept in prison. So that's, I, I wonder if you want to comment on that. Yeah, so the numbers went up, but they were already really high. Like over 60% of black, uh, uh, excuse me, over 60% of people incarcerated in New Jersey are already black. So, you know, to go any higher is like just everybody, especially in a state that only 13% of the population is black. New Jersey has the highest racial disparity of any state in the country. It's a 12 to 1. So we're, we're, we're doing worse than like Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. So. So, and the second part, <clears throat> in terms of abolition, you'd like to see people not sent to prison. So if Donald Trump were convicted of a felony, would you like to extend that to him too? So, so I won't, I mean, <laughs> so it's funny you say that because the, the, in the abolition chapter, right, we're talking, we, what's that? Well, so, so in the abolition chapter, you got to remember, I was, I was writing this between 2010, 2013. The guys did make an exception for one individual, and that was George W. Bush. They were like, George W. Bush absolutely should go to prison. We've kind of forgot about how much of a war criminal he is and all that kind of stuff, and now he kind of gets paraded around as like this kind of grandpa that likes to go to football games, like they were showing him last night. But so, yeah, maybe, I mean, may, there, you know, I'll end on this. There's rules and there's always exception to rules. So we'll, 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 we'll say that about Donald Trump. <laughs> I think that's a great point to end on. So um, I've been asked to ask you all to join us for a lovely reception after this. Um, Calvin will be there with books and he'll be ready to sign them and to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. And thank you, Sarah, for doing this.